dating of the Hebrew Bible, how do we come about understanding exactly when this book or books were actually written? Most of Christians and those who are fundamentalists will date these books to the maximalist position, meaning as far back as humanly possible. I mean, even Moses wrote it. I've heard people say Adam wrote his section in Genesis. That's how fundamentalist they are. And then you have those who say, no, we're on the extreme minimalist side. It must have been written at the latest possible date. And in doing so, they are not in the middle. Well, Ronald Hendall, Dr. Hendall, is going to take us into why he places the dating in the middle. Someone who's a linguistic expert and will explain to us why scholars date these books when they do. Don't forget to join our Patreon, like the video, subscribe to the channel. So much more of this content will keep coming. Love you guys. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. If you're new to the channel, hit the like button, subscribe so you can see more of this content. Have you ever asked yourself, how old is the Hebrew Bible? I mean, as a fundamentalist Christian, Moses wrote the Dagnab thing, at least the first five books, and then it goes on from there. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that, and it takes many years of getting involved in this to even realize what kind of can of worms you're opening when you get into this. So today we have Professor Ron Hendel. It's Ronald Hendel, correct? Yeah, either one. Either one. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Hendall is joining us today. I'm super excited about him uh, teaching us today on how to go about dating the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, if you will. And it, it's probably at various dates for various things, but we're going to get into some of this stuff. And number one, he is uh, Professor Hendall has been a member of the Berkeley Berkeley facility or faculty, sorry, since 1999 and has served as chair of Jewish studies, the Department of Near Eastern Studies and the Graduate Program in Ancient History and Meter Mediterranean Archaeology. Hendel approaches the Hebrew Bible from a variety of angles, history of religions, textual criticism, linguistics, comparative mythology, literature, and cultural memory, as we did last time with Exodus. He is the editor-in-chief of the Hebrew Bible, a critical edition, a new, a new critical edition of the Hebrew Bible, whose first volume, Proverbs by Michael, uh, Michael Fox, was published in 2015. He is also writing a new commentary on Genesis. Did you finish that commentary? I'm going to finish this summer. Awesome. So, <laughs> first year, first year. so it's, a, it's a new commentary on Genesis for the Yale Anchor Bible in 1999. He received the Frank Moore C Cross Publications Award from the American Schools of Oriental Research. His books include the text of Genesis 1 through 11, Textual Studies and Critical Edition, Oxford, 1998, Remembering Abraham, Culture, History, and Memory in the Hebrew Bible, Reading Genesis, 10 Methods, uh, The Book of Genesis, A Biography, and steps uh, steps to a new edition of the Hebrew Bible. And uh, how old is the Hebrew Bible? A linguistic, textual, and historical study forthcoming. With those books specifically, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you guys to go to Amazon. Be sure to check it out. He was also in a written debate, if you will, on the topic of Exodus here. Five views on the Exodus. Reading Genesis, 10 Methods, How Old is the Hebrew Bible is going to be relevant to the topic today, Remembering Abraham, the book of Genesis. You can go there. All of these books are down in the Amazon link down in the description. Recommended Myth Vision books. You guys can go there or just go to Amazon.com and find them. So with that being said, I will not waste any more time, Dr. Hendall. I think it's important that you take us. How do you even begin to come up with this? Because historiography for the longest, from what I understand, a lot of times is where they maximize the dating. Uh, it sounds like Moses wrote this. Moses wrote it. Then this is when it was written. But then you also have like a uh, historical methodology that can utilize like archaeology or other potential methods to try and figure out, well, what's the latest this probably was written? So you have minimalist and you have maximalist. And you, you're probably going to say both are wrong in some sense. <laughs> and there's probably a middle ground, I suspect. But Please introduce us to the subject matter. Okay, so this is a this is a kind of a complicated topic, and you have to be a little bit of a nerd to be able to understand all of the details and the reasoning and stuff. Uh, so I'll oversimplify. Um, yeah, so dating the Hebrew Bible is different than you know normal dating of teenage boys and girls. It's a more complicated <laughs> process. Uh, 
Um, and uh, as you can imagine, it involves all sorts of different things. We, get, we have archeolo archeological evidence, we have textual evidence, uh, we have you know, various kinds of analyses of, of the history of the transmission of the text, you know, the scribal recopying of it. We have the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are now our oldest texts of the Hebrew Bible. So there's all sorts of different things that go into it. Some of them are really exciting and some of them are really boring. Uh, some of the, some of what, what, what uh, I do in this book called How Old is the Hebrew Bible, uh, which was co-written with uh, Jan Yosten, a European scholar, we, we, we try to explore what we know about the history of the Hebrew language. So the, the, the punchline is that languages change over time. Okay, so English is different <clears throat> than it was in Shakespeare's time, in Chaucer's time. English is different than it was in the time of your grandparents. Okay, and the language that you speak is different than the language of your grandchildren. So language is always changing in subtle ways, in, in noticeable ways. Um, you know, things that are that you and I would regard as slang today might be normal, formal speech, you know, in 50 years. So it's always in a process of change because people speak slightly different dialects and, you know, young people speak different language than old people. And so there's always kinds of lots of dirt and, and um, irritants within the language that, that make it behave this way or that way. The invention of new things, you know, computers, laptops, keyboards, things like that. Um, another important factor is uh, language contact. That is to say, other languages that come into contact with English. So we have, in English, we have lots of words that come from German or from Arabic, and probably in the future we'll have more words from Chinese. Uh, when, when a culture becomes dominant, um, words from that language will seep into other languages. Okay, so, so, it, so there's kind of a global conversation that goes on. So you have influences from other languages and within the language, there's all sorts of changes. So we're looking primarily in this book, how old is the Hebrew Bible, uh, at how ancient Hebrew changed over time. Okay, and there's lots of things that we know that ancient Hebrew is a, a member of a larger language family that's usually called the Semitic language family. And within the Semitic language family, there's different sub branches. There's, you know, Northwest Semitic and East Semitic and South Semitic. And the, the particular grouping that the ancient Hebrew belongs to is called the Canaanite languages. So there's little, you know, sub, sub families and larger families and cousins and things like that. So we have a fairly good idea of how ancient Hebrew emerged because we know these older Canaanite languages and these older Semitic languages. Hold on, Hebrew's not the oldest? I'm just teasing that. Just teasing. Hebrew's <laughs> not the oldest. People used to think it was uh, because it's the language that, you know, God speaks when he creates the world in Genesis right. 1, okay? Uh, but as modern linguistics has become its own field, people figured all this stuff out about language families. So, you know, English is a member of the Indo-European family and you can trace the lineages and the cousins and the ancestry of our English words. And if you look at any dictionary, you'll, or a good dictionary, you know, you'll see the etymology of this English word goes back to old French and then it goes to Latin and then to Greek and pro even proto-Indo-European. Okay, so words themselves have their own genealogical history. So Hebrew, we can locate in this genealogy. Now, this all, this was all knowledge that emerged uh, during the period of the Enlightenment and later, and, and it dethroned the traditional idea that Hebrew was the original language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, e even the idea that saying that Hebrew, you, you said that in joke, but yeah. actually it was a big deal when people started saying, no, you know, maybe Arabic's older than Hebrew or maybe Sanskrit is older than Hebrew. And now we know that, uh, you know, there are all these other phases of Canaanite languages and Semitic languages that are older than Hebrew. 
Well, One, I said that because I actually know people personally, Orthodox Jews, who actually believe that still. That's that's well, sure. It's because it's a faith thing too, by the way. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think fundamentalist Christians would believe the same thing because you know it says God said, "Let there be light," in Hebrew. Right. It says that right there, and if God said, you know, "Yehi or." In Hebrew, that means Hebrew was the original language. So, you know, fundamental, this this is the idea that Hebrew is the oldest language comes from a reading of the book of Genesis. Hmm. Now we have other ways of knowing things about language, which conflicts with the book of Genesis. That's the whole story of the Bible in the modern world. What happens when you have other sources of knowledge besides the Bible? So this is where we're looking at. We're looking at how to understand what is the current state of knowledge about the history of the Hebrew language, both where the Hebrew language came from and also developments within Hebrew. So here's what we are able to show. And, and, and let me say again that this is, a, this is a stream of modern inquiry that has been going on for at least 200 years. Okay, the, the first milestone was a book that came out in 1815 by a guy named Wilhelm Gesenius. And Gesenius is the guy who wrote the first comprehensive modern dictionary of Hebrew that we still use, you know, in its like 20th edition. So Gesenius is a great figure in, the, in our understanding of the Hebrew language. So Gesenius wrote this massive dictionary. He also wrote... Um, a huge grammar that we still use in you know its 20th edition and he wrote a little book about the history of the hebrew language so what essentially what we're doing in in our book is updating gesenius's little book that he wrote 200 years ago so it, we're not presenting you know some we're presenting little wrinkles little angles little details that are new but the big picture is something that we're building on you know generations of, of of good scholarship. So, so in, uh, I was going to oh, say, yeah. we're, do, we're doing an airplane view, and I love this because yeah. you're getting them the general idea that language changes. Which those yeah. are the trees. I, if I could use the forest as an example, those are the trees. Yeah. But um, maybe we're going to come down a little and look at like, maybe you can give us a, a brief overview of like what text might be, and I know there's documentary hypothesis source material that's older or not, but we can get a little right. deeper into it, I guess. Is yeah, so let's get a little down and, and look at the trees a little bit from the forest. So none of the language that's in the Hebrew Bible is as old as the period of Moses. Okay, so this, this uh, corroborates other scholarship and other observations and historical details that show that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, for example. Okay, it's not the language. Uh, you know, there, there might be a couple of of very old small pieces, but for the most part, this is language of the first millennium BC. Okay, and Moses lived in the second millennium BC. So none of it is the language of Moses. So right away, we're getting into trouble with fundamentalist Christians and Orthodox Jews. It's written in a later period than Moses. Okay, um, the oldest ling the, the oldest parts that we can date more or less linguistically are a bunch of old poems, and these poems have very archaic, very old uh, grammatical features, uh, features that we do find in some second millennium Canaanite languages. And these are poems like the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15, which is a song of praise about the crossing of the Red Sea, uh, the blessings, uh, Jacob's blessings of his uh, children in Genesis 49. These are sort of tribal blessings where he blesses you know, Reuben and Simeon and Gad and Judah. Uh, similarly, Moses' blessings in, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy uh, 33. He's blessing the tribes and stuff. Uh, and there's an old poem in Judges called the Song of Deborah, which is a song of victory over uh, Canaanite armies led by uh, Deborah, who's a judge, and, and her generals. 
So these are a handful of very old pieces, and, and they're old because we can find these very old linguistic bits and pieces in them, old verbal forms, uh, old um, patterns of nouns and verbs, uh, old uses of uh, different um, features that, that have close continuities with what we know of second millennium Canaanite languages. So there's a kind of measuring stick that we can use. So these old poems, uh, which are really wonderful pieces, but they're very difficult to read because they have all these archaic features. The main part of the, the prose that you find in the first half of the Bible, let's say, in the Pentateuch and in the former prophets and the books of Joshua and Judges and Kings and Samuel and stuff, this, uh, so the prose text is what we belongs to a dialect that we call classical biblical Hebrew. And classical biblical Hebrew is a first millennium uh, dialect. Uh, we, we, can, we can more or less date it to the monarchic period of ancient Israel. So this is after the time of King David and King Solomon and going up to the time of the Babylonian conquest. So we're talking about from the 10th or 9th century to the 6th century. Okay, so that's a pretty long span of time. And there's there's some changes that we can see within this period of classical biblical Hebrew. Uh, we can show from inscriptions, we have a, a decent number of Hebrew inscriptions from the monarchic period. And we can show that the language of the inscriptions is pretty much the same as the language of classical biblical Hebrew texts. So that gives us a kind of independent peg to measure against to, to tell to tell you know more or less when this stuff was written. Uh, so most of these books, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and so forth, Samuel, Kings, uh, are written in classical biblical Hebrew, which places them for the most part within the period of the monarchy. So ninth to sixth century, let's see, maybe even you can say ninth to seventh century. BCE. Now that's pretty good. That gives us a window of when this stuff was written, which is, you know, pretty precise. And you can tell it's not written earlier than the ninth century, and it's not lit, written after the seventh or sixth century. So that's a if kind I, of a if, window. If I may, this recently I've actually had uh, Zvi Bendor Benit on about the lost tribes of Israel. Really, really wonderful guy. A lot of the scholars I interview, like I love interviewing you guys because you'll probably not even know a name of somebody or you might or you'll be like i never really checked their work but i find like how do i connect all these scholars to try and like figure out what makes the most sense and one of the things that kept getting me because i entertain mem I, I entertain minimalism as well as uh, various forms uh in between that range even interested in listening to the maximalist nonetheless uh i think there's a middle ground like you're discussing here. One of the things that just kind of, I guess, combining everything you said with linguistics and looking at archaeological times in the text themselves, as well as the historiography of other known Assyrian records, Babylonian records, you know, looking at the reality on the ground in history, it seems to me, and this is just my hunch, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, I just based on the scholars I've talked to, Jeremiah, Ezekiel's included in this, but Isaiah and Jeremiah big time, they prophesied that all the tribes were going to come back. Well, Babylonian exile happens and it, it didn't happen as they prophesied. All of them didn't come back. Judah came back, but they're still expecting. So really there's a failed prophecy. Why would someone write this after the events? You see what I'm trying to get at? Like yeah. I get ex eventu. This is a good dating mechanism in my opinion, because if we could show Jeremiah and Isaiah prophesied certain things that didn't happen the same way a scholar looks at Daniel, and says, look at Daniel, you know this is Antiochus Epiphanes, you know he's writing in the second century, but then he gets all the prophecies wrong. Well, if Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel are prophesying certain things and they don't happen, why would you write a failure on purpose? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And that's, that's in a nutshell, the historical method. Okay, if it, and, and Daniel's an interesting example. If, you, if his prophecies are correct, up to the time of Antiochus Epiphany, right, the fourth, and then he's wrong afterwards, then you can say, oh, well, this was written pretty much around the time of Antiochus Epiphany's the fourth. Uh, 
And so, and that's what we think for, for that reason, that's kind of the, the real linchpin, but there's other reasons too, incre including linguistic reasons. So let me say that, that the book of Daniel is written in what we call late biblical Hebrew, okay, which is after uh, the exile and uh, during the second temple period. And there's different, again, there's also different dialects of late biblical Hebrew. But Daniel is written in late biblical Hebrew, and it and it even has some Greek loan words. Oh yeah. Which is going into this thing about language contact. So we can tell from linguistically that Daniel is written in the Second Temple period, and from the Greek loanwords, we can tell it's written during the Hellenistic period. So this corroborates what you're talking about with his prophecies, that it was written in the you know, third and second century BC, and no later than Antiochus Epiphanes. So, so the linguistic use... analysis corroborates these other analyses. And that's what I would say. Like, let's back up right to the first books that we find loanwords of Egyptian. Uh, so, so someone goes, what are you trying to do, Dr. Handel? You're trying to you, see you're, you're using it here and you're being a hypocrite. You know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you're not allowing the loan words of the Egyptians to play a part in dating as old as this 12th century BC or uh, there's loan words from Egypt. Why would there be loan words? And this I've heard often as an expert in the linguistics and a scholar. Can you can you prove to me like can you explain to our audience why? Egyptian loan words isn't something that has to be in the 12th, 13th century BC, but would still be practiced in the 9th to 6th century in the writing of these? Yeah, absolutely. Because Egypt was a major civilization, like I said, you know, American civilization now. You find English loan words in every language in the world because they're eating at McDonald's and they're using keyboards. Keyboard is a word in French, by the way. Isn't that funny? They don't like the 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 the, the French uh, language academy doesn't like that people say the word keyboard, and they made a French word for it, but people don't use it. People say le keyboard. Okay, oh, so wow. we're the we're the eight hundred pound gorilla now, and so our language and our techno language for our technology and inventions and stuff go into other languages. So Egypt was a huge uh, culture in antiquity. And as we talked about last time, there, there are a lot of Egyptian loan words. For example, the word for linen. You know, linen, to this day, we, we, we like Egyptian cotton is, is the expensive kind of sheets you can get, you know, yeah. if you get a bed, bath, and beyond. Egyptian cotton costs more than other cotton. Anyway, so the word for linen, which they made in Egypt, is an Egyptian word. It's an Egyptian loan word because you're buying this stuff, it was made there, it's got that word, and you use that word. Um, so the fact that you have Egyptian loan words means that you're using things that came from Egypt. Paper, the word paper comes from papyrus, which originally came from Egypt, okay? And there's all sorts of words for writing implements and the word for ink, the word for pen, I, but one of the words for pen comes from Egyptian, because Egypt had this very high um, scribal culture, and, and and this you know disseminated in the ancient world, and so there's Egyptian loan words for writing implements and for linen and things like that in uh, in ancient Hebrew. Some of those probably came into the language during the second millennium. That is to say, they came into pre-Hebrew forms of Canaanite. Mm -hmm. Okay, when Egypt was actually ruling over the land of Canaan. Uh, so you'd have Egyptian loan words in old Canaanite languages, and then they, they're then inherited into Hebrew once Hebrew forms. So, so these are old loan words. If, if I may, this is so contemporary loan words that would come in later as Egyptians, you know, trade different things and, and things like that. So to give like a, a just in that pocket of Egypt, to give a historical analysis, uh, we talked about this with the Exodus. Egypt was ruling all of Canaan. They were they were technically Egyptians, if you want to be like, I know they were called Canaanites, but they were under the jurisdiction. And when that collapsed and they were independent, so to speak, uh, and they became their own independent Israel, and, and they like to say, well, we're not no longer we're no longer Canaanites, we're we're Israelites. We have our own tribe now. Um, how long would you say were they un- they weren't ruled over yet till the Assyrians come on the scene. So technically 
the Egyptian loan words are really like living like they were just yesterday for like four or 500 years within the Canaanite religion. And then until the Assyrians come in and actually conquer, I guess they're still practicing these Egyptian loan word. Uh, well, what do you the, think? Thing about, the thing about loan words is you don't necessarily think of where they came from. For example, you know, one of my uh, nephews just finished kindergarten. Kindergarten. If you think of it, gee, that's a German word. The Germans invented kindergarten, you know, something I don't even know when they invented. I think in the early 20th century. It, it means the garden for children in German. But we don't think of it as a German word. We think of it as kindergarten. Restaurant. That's a French word. We don't. When we go to a restaurant, it doesn't have to be a French restaurant. I go to my local Mexican restaurant, my pizza restaurant. I don't think of it as a French word because it's not anymore. It came from French, but now it's English. So words get domesticated, you know, almost instantly once you start. Wow. Okay, so I don't need to think of, okay, Egypt's no longer ruling over this land. and But in history, they weren't conquered, or at least they weren't uh, under anything, any conquered uh, empire until Assyria, from what I understand. Yes, that's right. That's right. But that, Yeah. It's but, irrelevant, though, is what you're saying on this. Well, it, it's a right because you don't take languages. I mean, once you have ink and paper, what are you going to do? Get rid of ink and paper <laughs> or come up with a Hebrew word for ink and paper? That's like <laughs> the French trying to get a French word for keyboard. That's not what people do. Wow. Once you have a keyboard, you call it keyboard. And within like, you know, an hour, you forget that it's an English loan word and it's just a keyboard. It's just a word. So the you know so the so the origins of words aren't necessarily remembered. There's a scholar I've actually yeah, tried. Next time you go to a restaurant, <laughs> I will. I'll be like, honey, do you want to go to a non-French restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> There's a scholar, and uh, I I don't know why I'm pulling a blank here. He actually argues that sometimes language doesn't equate the timing in which something actually is written. Um, you probably know who he is. He's a professor in the field. Um, he's not a minimalist either, but he he makes this argument that and, and I think there's a minimalist um, that I actually talked to. He's one of the more extreme minimalists. He actually goes further than Thomas L. Thompson on things. Um, Russell Gamirkin. I don't know if you've heard of his name before. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen some of his stuff. Um, Would you like to address yeah. some of that? Well, what some people, so so what I've been talking about is just kind of plain vanilla history history of language. Right. Language has changed over time, and you know, using historical references or using loan words sometimes. I mean, for, for example, you know, the Greek loan words in Daniel are at, at a time when Greece was a influential civilization. That kind of goes with the goes with the whole deal. Uh, so it's not a pre-Greek right. text because there's Greek loan words in it. Books that have a lot of Persian loan words, like in you know the Book of Esther or the Book of Chronicles, you can tell that's after the time that Persia has become a, a, an important civilization. Now you don't have to be ruled by them to have loan words by them. It just has right. to be an influential civilization. Just like you know we don't rule France, I think, but they still say le keyboard. Um, so you can use that as a as a general way of of you know telling more or less when things were or at least you can tell when it's not earlier than x it's not earlier than the time when greek civilization was important or earlier than the time when persia was important even if you're not necessarily a vassal yet right okay, there were there were greek loan words in hebrew before alexander the great conquered the persian empire um What are your problems with minimalism? There's some people that, that try to add a little, uh, kind of like a little epicycle or a little fudge factor here. And, they, and, and people, these are people who say, well, you know, I think that the book of uh, Deuteronomy or something really is really late, really is written in the Persian period or the Hellenistic period. And I would say, well, then how can you explain why it's why it's written in classical biblical Hebrew, which we can date on the basis of you know clearly datable inscriptions to the monarchic period? 
Mm. They say, oh, well, someone could have uh, written it in an arch archaizing style. That is to say, they could have consciously written it in a way that mimics classical biblical Hebrew. Now, it's true, it, so my response to that is, it's true that people do mimic classical biblical Hebrew. The book of Daniel mimics classical biblical Hebrew but it doesn't do a very good job. Mm. <laughs> I can mimic Shakespeare, but I would do a terrible job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, could, I could even use a word like fardle, and I could say thee and thou all I want, but someone who really knows the language of Elizabethan England would be able to see through my mimicking Shakespearean language in a second. So this is what we this is what we have. The Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, are really diligently mimicking classical biblical Hebrew, but they can't do it. Words flow in from their normal language, and and you have all sorts of uh, particularly uh, words you can sort of fake, but the syntax, the grammar, they get all wrong. Because syntax and grammar are things that you can't, re you don't really think about consciously unless you're a crazy linguist like I am. <laughs> okay, when you're speaking a language, you're not thinking consciously of you know where the noun goes and where the relative clause goes and how do you modify this. You just do it. But grammar also changes over time, and that's much more difficult to mimic from a later period. So people say, well, I think the book of Genesis was written in the Hellenistic period and not in 600 years, or not uh, three, four or 500 years earlier in the monarchic period. And I say, well, if they mimicked it, they did a perfect job, okay? Because it, it reads perfectly as classical biblical Hebrew and it's really hard to mimic older grammar. When let, me give, classical... let me give you an example. Okay. There are verbal forms in the book of Genesis that disappeared later. Whole verbal forms, you know, particular kind of uh, passive form that disappeared because sometimes forms disappear. And in later times, they reinterpreted it as being a different kind of verbal form. But they'd forgotten it. This verbal form is called the call passive. It was rediscovered in medieval times. Hmm. Medieval grammarians had been forgotten for a thousand years, for for more than that, for you know fifteen hundred years or more. How can you mimic a verbal form that in your period people have totally forgotten? So the people who are minimalists and deal and date all of these books um, that are written in classical biblical Hebrew. They date them to the Persian period or the, the Hellenistic period. They're putting a lot of weight on someone being able to mimic this without any deviations and therefore being able to mimic linguistic structures, grammatical structures that were dead and forgotten in their period. So, so that's a big burden to be able to, to, to make that claim. And I just think it, I don't buy it. So this is a great question then, because um, number one, when do we date? biblical classical hebrew what would be the um the, the 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 oldest you would maybe stretch that language in that form of the language to in the er, the latest in which it stops using do we have an approximate dating and then i have one follow-up question yeah so the classical stuff and this is the prose that you find primarily in the pentateuch and the former prophets this is the this is the stuff i'm talking about that dates to the monarchic period uh, and I would say most of it's from the 9th to the 7th century. And then the next phase we have is what we call transitional biblical Hebrew that has classical features and late features mixed together. And tr so this transitional phase, you can date to the 6th century and with a little bit of overflow in both directions. And then after that period, during the 5th century and later, you have what we call late biblical Hebrew. So you have classical, transitional, and late. And mm. all of those you can sort, you, you can tell that it's a sequence. Okay. And you can date by inscriptions and other historical indicators when each of those happened. Now, as I mentioned before, there's also a fourth phase archaic biblical Hebrew, which we only have in those few poems. Mm. 
that I mentioned, the Song of Deborah and the right. Song of the Sea and the Blessings of Jacob and Moses. So that's a very small body of texts that are even older than the classical biblical. Wow. So really, those are our four things, and you can put them in a sequence. Okay. The the other thing that I deal with a lot on my channel is like <laughs> parallels, right? Like, all right, is there some type of either genetic connection, mimesis maybe, depending on the, you know, obviously that requires a genetic connection, um, or cultural uh, adaptation here. Sometimes we look at Genesis and we wonder, is there any Greek uh, uh, influence? And so if, if the approach that we take is the methodology you're describing, is it possible that we don't require you to have to be down in the Hellenistic age to see Greek overtones happening here? In fact, there might have been cultural, uh, if I could use the term, adoption of stuff, um, sure. because they're they're bumping into each other prior to any Hellenistic happening. What 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 do you yes. think? Oh, I totally agree there. And and with and for someone who says, well, look, there's some things in Genesis that sound a lot like things in, you know, Hesiod's Theogony or the Iliad or something like that. And my response is absolutely. These are part of the same cultural world. I mean the. the the Homeric epics are written in you know, more or less the same time as many of these books in the Pentateuch. Uh, and they're all participating in this world of the ancient Near East and the Eastern Mediterranean. And there's, you know, in Homer, they talk about Phoenician traders that are coming on boats and doing things. So you know that there's trade between the Middle East and, and Greece, you know, and we find there's archaeological evidence of this. You find uh, Greek pottery in Israelite sites, beautiful little painted things from Greece and Cyprus and stuff. Uh, and you even find things like uh, Mesopotamian cylinder seals in some of the old uh, Greek Mycenaean cities. Wow. So from the late Bronze Age through the Iron Age, there's always contacts in the Eastern Mediterranean because there's, there's trade contacts. They, they had, so you can see some of that in language too. The word for wine, in Hebrew, it's yayin. In Greek, it's oinos. That's the same word. They have the same word for wine. Why? Because they're trading wine all through this period and they're calling it the same thing and they're drinking it. <laughs> and Israel was actually a big manufacturer of wine and oil. And, uh, you know, and they all go into these boats and we find some of these boats we find in, in underwater archaeology, you find these like eighth century Phoenician boats and they're filled with big jugs that were that once were filled with wine and oil. So this is a huge commodity that's all. And so if, so if wine and oil is going back and forth, you know, that stories and ideas and you know, tall tales are going back and forth about the giants who lived in the land or mighty heroes who destroyed things. You know, the, the story of Hercules and the story of Samson are very similar. Yeah, I was thinking strong about guys. He lifts city gates and, and defeats lions with his bare hand. You can see that the stories themselves have a strong resemblance to each other. And it's and it's because these peoples were in contact with each other. Did the Philistine people, do they have any Greek uh, connections? Uh, yeah, the, the Philistines were from uh, the uh, Mediterranean area. They were, they were originally, I guess what we would call, th there's some unclarity, but it looks like some of them were Mycenaean Greeks. Some of them may have come from Anatolia, but they spoke a, this kind of old Greek language. So there's a, a number of Philistine words. Some of them end up in Hebrew. Wow. Uh, the word so Samson for, was sleeping with those girls. <laughs> exactly. And they were talking to each other. And the word for, for helmet is probably come, is, is an old Indo-European word that probably came through the Philistines. I heard that the Philistines armor has Greek, uh, it, it's very Greek-like. So that's why I ask. And a lot of times I hear this, and I'm not an expert. This is why I have you on. Um, I've actually heard that, well, this is evidence of a Hellenistic, um, you know, some type of Hellenistic uh, in influence because Greeks wore these types of armor. But uh, it's not what you're saying makes sense too. So yeah, Greeks what, wore armor for a long time in battle. 
<laughs> so mm. it wasn't an invention of Hellenistic times. We have, you know, pictures on old Greek vases of the kinds of armor that they're imagining, you know, Achilles and people in the in the Trojan War are wearing. And it looks like what the Philistines are wearing in uh, in in uh, Mesopotamian reliefs of and, and Egyptian reliefs of the Philistines. I want to take us into something a little more complicated, but I'm sure it's not complicated to you. It might be complicated trying to orate this, but uh, the four sources, or if you will, five, depending on how you want to view this, of the documentary hypothesis. How hmm. do we date something when you have a redactor who's obviously put this, uh, let's connect these narratives. We mm -hmm. have Joseph being sold to so-and-so and sold to so-and-so. And this brother right. did this and this brother did that. How do we date it after re redactor's fingerprints have been all over this type of stuff? Good. That's a good question. That's a good question. And the, the answer is, as far as we can tell, the redactor actually had a pretty light touch much of the time. Wow. So where there are two stories that clearly overlap, like Joseph being sold into slavery, Joseph being either sold or killed or this, you know, by his brothers and ending up in Egypt, uh, the redactor combined those two stories uh, and added some harmonizing details. But for the most part, the redactor didn't, at least in instances like this, the redactor didn't just rewrite it all. Because if the redactor had just rewritten it, we wouldn't be able to tell there's two different stories. So the redactor did a kind of cut and paste sort of thing. You know, a paragraph of this story, a paragraph of this story, maybe a little harmonizing line here. And you can, to a certain degree, unmix those things and see what the original stories were. And this is because, as I say, the redactor had a light hand. And preserved much of the much of the sources uh, as he found them, and so when you do this kind of analysis, and you can then look at the language, which gets us back to our topic, and you can tell, for example, that the J source belongs to an earlier phase of Hebrew than the P source. The J source begins to belongs to classical biblical Hebrew. The P source, I would say, belongs to transitional biblical Hebrew. Because the P source has a combination of classical features and a few late features. Interesting. The, the J source has all classical features, including that verbal form that I told you was forgotten. It's still alive in the J source. It's been forgotten already by the P source. Wow. So there are little things like that you can say, oh, look. This is earlier than this. This text, the, the language stratum that this text reflects, is earlier than the language that this text reflects. So J is earlier than P, and there's other criteria too, but that's a particularly nice one. When do you think the redactor did this? So this is a great question on dating the material sources and say well, we got a J, we got a P, and they're probably floating around in the tradition and in various groups probably uh, have been practicing this. When do you put a date? And I know this is guess, it, it, like, you know, there's no like, I know exactly the day on August the 16th of, you know, 723 BC. Um, but if you were to put a time on it, when would you say the closest guessing that this redactor said, it's time to put it into print? It's time to really put these things down as a Pentateuch. Yeah, well, as you're, as you're saying, you know, it's sort of a guess. Uh, but there's, you know, indicators that it can't be earlier than this and it can't be later than this. Most people would put it at the time of the Babylonian exile, the time when these when these uh, the Pentateuchal uh, sources were combined together. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, that the redactor has a light touch. And so it's hard to tell. It's hard to date that person's language, because he just gives a few harmonizing uh, bridges here and there between the source text, and usually takes the language of the source text and combines them to, to smooth out those transitions. So we don't have specific linguistic evidence for that, but the time of the Babylonian exile makes sense. And this um, is kind of 
represented in the Bible in the scene in uh, the book of Nehemiah when Ezra comes back from the Babylonian exile and comes back to Jerusalem and reads to them the completed Pentateuch. Wow. And so you can tell from, from the description of what Ezra is reading that, oh, look, he's getting this from the J source, he's getting this from the P source. And so you can see they've been combined, at least by the time that text has been written. Now, whether that actually happened, you know, people will say maybe it's imagined or something like that, but still someone imagined that scene when he's writing, when, when he's reading this stuff together. And it makes sense that someone would have done that during the exile, this time of upheaval. They brought some texts with them and they spent their time combining them together to kind of rebind the wounds of the nation. And they brought it back and have this complete thing. So, so that makes sense that it's that during that period. That's actually a wonderful point. I, I'd like to ask you in this vein, um, social identity seems to play a huge role. We know that the lost Israelites, Israel, Northern Kingdom, uh, plays a huge significant eschatological view for restoration that one day uh, they would come back. The prophets constantly harp this. But we have stories that seem to be Northern and we have stories that seem to be Southern. And it mm. seems like the, the redactor may have been on the side of the South. Uh, there, there are, and agree with me or not, I'd love to hear you break this down because the way I understood it from Zvi Benit, uh, Dr. Benit, he said, you know, what seems to be here is that North, the Southern Kingdom after the Assyrian exile happens, and then of course the Babylonian happens, the Southern Kingdom like doubles in size. So there's this influx of Northern probably stories different sources coming down and they're saying, Hey, our patriarch, Jacob, our patriarch, Joseph, our patriarch, Abraham. And then here you have Southern ones who are, we have ours, we have ours. So that's why we find like Northern and Southern narratives. Uh, am I onto something with that? Yeah. There, I mean, this is all stuff that you can infer from the stories themselves. You know, that this particular text has an emphasis on certain places that tend to be Northern uh, this source tends to emphasize places that are Southern. And, you know, so it's an inference. You can't prove it, right. but it's an inference that this one, maybe this particular text, the E source, for example, might have Northern roots, and maybe it was brought down to Jerusalem after the Assyrians destroyed the Northern kingdoms. And then the, the J source is written in the South. And when someone combines J and E, you're combining these old texts that came from the North and the South. And so you get this melange of northern features and southern features, which which isn't to say that there aren't some, you know, southern features in, in the e-source and northern features in the j-source, but it's a matter of emphasis. And so, it, and again, it makes sense that during the Babylonian exile, there's a desire to combine these things, you know, to 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 create a kind of national identity based on a continuous text, because uh, you know the 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 nation has become fragmented. And so there's a way of kind of creating a restored identity by combining these texts together. And so this is probably, you know, one aspect of the intention of the redactor. That's wonderful. I've heard someone told me that the canon of the Hebrew Bible was closed at the end of the 6th century or 5th century BC. Um, one of the reasons maybe Daniel is trying to stretch back into the 6th century and pretend to be under the Babylonian uh, as he, he was some noble in the in the you know in the court or whatnot, um, that's not that's not true. There's no validity to anything of the canon being closed or. Well, it's it's an overstatement to say that, but what the, what you can say is that the classical period, well, just calling it the classical period gives it that aura. Okay, so there is a sense that there was a classical period, the period of the great prophets, the period of the kings. And uh, the book of Daniel, placing Daniel in that period, gives him a sense of that aura of belonging to this classical period. And so this is so you situate your your book in that period, even if it's written in a later period. Uh, so so there is something to be said for that. And and this is you know the aura of even in the language. This is the aura of classical biblical Hebrew that the writers of Daniel and the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls are trying to emulate because they're emulating this period. Uh, 
uh, when you know it was a golden age to them. It was the classic period. Now let me say that the when you say canon, that's a word that has a lot of different meanings because uh, there's a lot of books that are in the Hebrew Bible that were clearly written during the Persian period. You know, Esther, Jonah, Chronicles, and so forth, and they made it in. Now they're mostly in the third part of the canon, the writings. So there are there are certain you know parts of it that have a certain tendency towards closure, and then another part, and then it's, so it's a gradual process, and there's different parts, but there's also places even in the oldest parts in you know Genesis or, or other parts of the Pentateuch, where Second Temple scribes added things or revised things. So it wasn't even the Pentateuch was not completely closed. You could, you know, recalculate the ages of the the ancestors of Abraham or the the, the patriarchs before the flood. Uh, and these are things that scribes were doing well into the Persian and possibly even the Hellenistic period. Um, you know, even if those books were already authoritative, authoritative at a small level, you could. Do so. Do little revisions and expansions and things like that. Wow. So the, the idea of closed is a little too strong. It is interesting. There's nuance there. There's it, nuance. This whole subject is so um, fascinating to me. It make believe it or not, I'm going to say this publicly. I want everyone to know this. This makes me love the Bible that much more. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Yeah. Like I, I, yeah. taking it out of the hands of the fundamentalist. Yeah. And, and and not allowing them to monopolize this. It's like, no, they oh, you hate the Bible. That's what, no, we want to actually understand the Bible. And that's why I love the Bible itself. Not because I'm going to live based on of a law in the Old Testament or something like, you know, I'm glad that was back then in many respects and that we have what we have now. But uh, I do love this, this, the whole collection of this idea, as well as other myths, other stories that I love learning about. So if there's anything we haven't touched, I hope you go down in the description and get the book, please. Uh, he's, he yeah. writes on this specifically, but is there something well, we haven't? Well, yeah. let me just say that this is what I tell my students. Okay, I tell them the Bible is actually much more interesting and much more powerful and much more profound than the way it's usually represented to you in Sunday school or in church or in synagogue. It's an amazing book. And all of these nuances make it even more amazing. And it's profound, but it's it's more profound, it's more nuanced, it's more sophisticated if you read it as it really is, instead of reading it through the lenses of what people told you when you were a kid. I will repeat this. Dr. Christine Hayes <laughs> actually debated a, Tal a Talmudic Jew on the Talmud. And he went up and it was unbelievable how she dealt with this, but he's like, Look, the, you want to know the who, the the why, the what, the when, the where, what the rabbi meant, what he said, but you're not applying the, what the saying is to you. And she said, listen, I want to know exactly what Rabbi Akiva, or Rabbi whoever, what they said, when they said it, why they said it, what was going on in their lives when they said it, exa the humanity of this. Mm -hmm. And and she said, I get a religious experience, if you can call it that, meaning there's some satisfaction that comes from this that I get from knowing those things that you get from just simply trying to apply the text without knowing all the context. So I'm no longer a Christian. I publicly say this. Um, you know, I, I don't you don't have to say anything about you, but I, I purposely say this and say I still get amazing experiences reading and finding out these things you're talking about today just because i love this stuff it's like reading history it's like so um yeah, history and its literature and its philosophy and its poetry it, it's an amazing stuff. But let me just say i'm a jew and i guess i can still be a jew if i don't read it literally because right. i'm a modern jew and you can be a christian you can be not a christian you don't have to be a fundamentalist right and in fact, it's better stuff if you're not a fundamentalist. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so I, would, much I would definitely put my money on Christine Hayes than a normal yeshiva booker when it comes to understanding the sophistication and nuances and profundity of the Talmud. She's good. Wow. Yes, she is. Dr. Hindall, this is amazing. Is there anything we didn't hit that you gotta you just gotta say about dating of the of the Bible or the Hebrew Bible? 
No, it's very nerdy kind of stuff to be interested in, but <laughs> that's what I do. And so I don't I don't recommend anyone actually read this book because it's it's complicated. So well, if you really want to don't, don't buy this book. It's too it's way too complicated. <laughs> Buy something that's more readable. Okay. What would you recommend? I mean. Well, in my list, but my book, uh, the book of Genesis, a biography, I would say that's the only one on that list that's actually readable by non-specialists. But And it was written for non-specialists. Excellent. Well, you heard it from the horse's mouth. <laughs> you know, you, you eat. Anyways, uh, ladies and gentlemen, go into the description. This has been wonderful. We have so much more to discuss. Your book, Genesis 1 through 11, I really would love to do an interview on, uh, with you on that and talk about the Mesopotamian uh, polemics that are going on within this, if you're interested. Uh, giants uh, play a huge role in this. And so, ah, man, we, <laughs> you know I'm going to love that one. Okay. Got Thank it. Thank you. Yes, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, if you forget, don't forget, I always say this, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>